Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Your host is Deborah Rue, CEO of Rue Global Impact and co-founder and chairwoman of Billion Strong, an identity and empowerment organization designed to bring billions of voices of persons with disabilities together. To join the global community and to donate to the cause, visit billion-strong.org. That's billion-strong.org. And now on to the episode. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Rue, and this is Human, Human Potential at Work. And I'm really excited about um, my guest today. My guest today is Amadea Bailey, and she is a world famous artist. And luckily, she has some of her beautiful art behind her. And we can see a little bit of a garden. But let's, I also want to take the time to do a visual um, description because a lot of my viewers, they might be blind or have vision loss. So I want to make sure that we include everyone. So I am a white woman. I have gray and purple hair. I figure if I'm going to go gray, I'm going to have fun with it. And I'm wearing a green plaid shirt and a black sweater and wearing purplish glasses going with the theme. And my guest today, Medea Bailey, all oh, her work is so amazing. And she has such a powerful journey as a creative. And as she was just saying before we went on air, she actually was, she did plays and stuff when she was in middle school and high school. So she's always been a creative. But Amadea, welcome, welcome, welcome to the program. Do you mind telling the audience just a little bit about you and maybe even that beautiful painting behind you as well? Absolutely, Deborah. It's my great pleasure to be here with you this morning. I had a very interesting childhood, I have to say. I was blessed with parents who loved to travel, and I was born in Germany. My father was a professor of theology. He was getting his PhD, and as and so I, I lived in Germany. I lived in Switzerland, and then when I was five years old, my father took the whole family. There were three kids and his wife, and we moved to East Africa. And we wow. lived in Kenya, outside of Nairobi, in a very tiny little village. And it was an extraordinary time. We were there for Kenya's independence from the British. It was very jubilant. There was a lot of festivities. I went to a wonderful multiracial school, one-to-one -one ratio of Africans to Asians to Europeans. And it was a it was a blissful time. It was sort of uh, an, a very extraordinary place to be a, a child between the ages of five and ten. I was riding horses outside in the bush. I was very connected to the land. The Kenya is on the equator. It, it's uh, it was a very big palpable sky. It's a very earthy, organic, almost primordial place. So I have always said that I believe that experience of adventure, of expansion, of, I'd say, unbridled freedom at that age had a huge influence on my later becoming a painter, which, because I feel that all of those things I just described, adventure, freedom, exploration, expansion, those are all themes that I explore every day in my art. It is my desire to express joy and expansion and freedom, not just joy, but to explore uh, adventure and emotions and to live and express freely, which is really what I experienced as a child. Yes, so, and diversity. And diversity, exactly, exactly. I was so blessed to be able to live a, a mile away from an, a, a truly, a real African hut village, not fake. Like, I had friends what? that lived there. I had friends that were from England, from India, from Ethiopia. It was Definitely, it was an expanded childhood in that regard. So, yes, yes, I'm very grateful for that piece of it. So, yeah, fast, forward, 
fast forward, I ended up being back in this country. We moved back when I was 10 and I lived in Michigan for a while. My father taught at the University of Michigan. And then I was lucky enough to go to Yale University as an undergraduate. And I was an art history major. And the, re the way, the really, the thing that got me painting was that the summer of my junior year, I went into New York City to see a retrospective of Monet's late water lily paintings. And if you've seen those, they're these giant, enormous, beautiful, quite abstract and modern paintings that he did very late in his life. He was actually going blind when he was painting some of them. And I, I had a life altering experience looking at that work. The scale, the freedom, the color, all of it was very poignant. And I went back three days in a row and I left saying, I want to do that. I want to paint and move and dance across a big surface with color. And so in essence, I went back to Yale and I signed up for painting, drawing and sculpture. And I basically about three months in, I knew that this was going to be my life. I had no idea how it was going to unfold, whoever does, but I was hooked. So basically I moved to New York City after I graduated and I, I decided I wanted more schooling. So I went to school three years. I studied art and basically have been painting ever since. And that's how I started. I always had studios. I always paid for two rents. Don't ask me how I did it because in those days I had no money, very little money. But in New York in the 80s, you didn't need a lot of money. There were a lot of artists doing just fine, living on the edge, I must <laughs> say, but doing our thing. So... Base, and so I just want to say another piece about all this, which is that I became also at the same time a massage therapist. I first was a teacher of the Alexander Technique, which is a form of body alignment. Then I became a massage therapist because I really wanted to find a way to make a living in the early days doing something that mattered to me, that I felt was not being a waitress which was very difficult for me. I was not good at it. So I found this career, which I loved actually doing massage, doing teaching the Alexander technique. And it allowed me to work with clients in the morning and have all afternoon to paint for many years. So that was my life for a lot of years. I, I did have shows as an artist and I was painting basically five afternoons a week. I had studios all over. My last studio was an extraordinary space in Brooklyn, which had, an, it was on the seventh floor of an old paper factory. And I had a, an extraordinary view of the Manhattan skyline, the twin, the Brooklyn bridge, the twin towers at the time. And so that was my life for quite a few years. Until I came to a point, and this is really a very critical part of my journey, which is that when I turned 50, I made a decision that I really wanted to live 100% for my art. I had a lot of paintings. I had devoted many years to my painting life. It was never a hobby. It was always a very serious pursuit. And so at 50, I made a decision. I am going to give up the massage and I'm going to live 100%. And I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it, but I made that commitment and I basically slashed my massage practice by 90%. 
And I just focused 100%. I worked on my website. I, I had a coach. I, I was saying affirmations, morning, noon, and night. I am a successful artist. But I was also doing, I basically felt like I was not going to accept anything but being a full-time artist. There was something about my intention and my focus and my faith at that point that I needed to devote a hundred percent of my effort. I didn't know, I no longer wanted to be split between two careers. And there's something very powerful about that. I also, I burned the bridges behind it. So I felt energetically there was no going back. Like this is going to happen. And I have to say, I, nothing really happened for the first nine months. I was diligently doing the things that I just said, painting a lot, working on promoting myself. I had to confront in my mind, I think a big piece of it was confronting some limiting beliefs that I had around what I could have, what I desired, what uh, I had to, I had to expand my consciousness to believe that I was worth having what I wanted. And what I wanted was to live from my art. And so there was a lot of inner work. Don't get me wrong. This was not just a switch that I shifted. It was a lot of very deep inner work about my desire, about having, about what I felt capable of creating. And I'm happy to say that after nine months, the universe really gave me an extraordinary opportunity. I ended up meeting a collector who had, who loved my work and she was happened to be a big celebrity and she bought six of my paintings in the course of a year and basically funded more than a year of my life. And that was it. I, I never went back. I, my, my massage practice was over. And in the last, what has it been almost 14 years? I have to say that I, I'm a full-time artist. My, I make, 95% of my income is for my art. I've had extraordinary years selling to amazing collectors. And I just feel blessed every day that I get to do this thing, which I love, and people pay me for it. <laughs> and we're told that you can't be, m most people can't be a full-time artist. And I know that we tell our children, okay, you can dabble in that, but get a real job. And, and also we had talked about this before we got on air, but often people with disabilities want to be artists and creative. And once again, society keeps telling them, no, you can't do that. Oh no, that's not real. So that's why I think your story is so powerful. I also love that you made sure that you got ready for this life. You got ready by getting your mind in. Also that this woman that loved your art took the time to help you. And not just by your art, but really help you in other ways. And we have to help each other. We just have to help each other along the journeys. I believe, Amadea, that during times of intense trauma, um, like we're walking right now, that art and music can be some of the best gifts to us. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I also wanted to talk about... When you, I, I, I like to do art. I don't do art for anyone. It's, but I do it just because it soothes my mind. And so one thing, and I also am a writer. So one thing I've always found fascinating, Elizabeth Gilbert said this one time when she wrote her very famous book, Eat, Love, Eat, Love, and Pray, the way people responded to it surprised her. It's, oh, this was my story. And she's, wow. I'm surprised they took it there, but I think it's fascinating. And so she made the comment that you created as a creator 
and then you release it out in the world and what the world sees and the what the world feels from your art it's almost not your business. So I was just wondering if you would talk a little bit about that because I love your artwork because every time I look at it, I see a different part of a story. And it's like, okay, and I see that. I see, even the art that's behind you right now with the blues and the greens and the pinks, and it speaks to me differently every time I look at different parts of it. So I was just wondering if you would explore that topic a little bit. Well, yes, I will. My process is very organic. I don't have a plan whenever when I start a painting. I it I I'm come from the abstract expressionist school, which is really about expressing emotions in the moment and finding the painting through the process of painting. And for me, this is very exciting. It it can be difficult because I feel like part of my job is really navigating the unknown. Like I'm not coming in here with an agenda any day. It's like, I have to be open to the moment. I am, I do feel that I am a channel. And I think this is a really important thing to say is that I'm a meditator. I've been meditating for over 30 years, actually more. 40 years. And I meditate pretty much every day. And I see art making as somewhat of a spiritual discipline in that I, I am a vessel. I am a vehicle. I take really good care of my body. I exercise. I, I meditate. I dance. I do things that nourish me. And so that my 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 mind, my body, and my spirit is available and open to express something that's bigger than myself. And why I think, Deborah, that you see so many different things going on in my art is that they actually, I work on them over a long period of time. I usually have seven or eight, six, seven, eight paintings in my studio going at once, and I jump around and I'll work quickly at, on a painting at each sitting, but the paintings ex sometimes aren't done for a, eight, nine months, a year. So I keep coming back and building the layers and searching for, for little elements that work together, searching for balance. It's definitely like a journey, just like my childhood journey in Africa, each painting has a, a beginning, a middle, an end, like a journey. And I don't know where I'm going to end up. So the, it's a little bit like excavating. Like I have collage elements. When I travel, I bring back things, and sometimes they end up in my paintings, and then I cover them up, but there's a little tiny piece left over that you can see. This painting behind me has a number of collage elements it was actually, this painting went through so many different stages. And so there's a depth to it. There's a story. There's a piece of my life in each painting. And uh, the other thing I want to address, which is something you just said, Deborah, is the importance of creativity, not only for the people that are doing it. And yes, I believe every single human being, disabled or not, it has the ability to express themselves creatively. And sometimes people with disabilities are even closer to that kind of pure, direct art form. So I say anybody can be creative and go for it. It's your birthright. And as you said, we're living in really crazy, difficult times right now. And one of the things that's gotten me through this last crazy, almost two years, whatever it is, year and a half, is art. For me, it's making art, but also experiencing art, looking at other artists, looking at what they're doing. Because I believe that we need art because we need beauty. We need objects that are authentic and that come from the soul, that are spiritually directed, that are that are that are poetic. 
that we can look at and derive pleasure and satisfaction and even allow our minds to go into imaginative places that we might not go to if we weren't looking at this big blue expanse on a canvas or watching a movie that, you know, that speaks to us and moves us or makes us cry. Ooh, that's beautiful. Amadeo, what, as you were creating, as you're creating and, and then you have customers that buy your artwork, have you, were you surprised at how your artwork spoke to some of your clients? Did it, have they surprised you with what they're seeing? I, I would just think that they would. I, I would. I would be like, oh, let me tell you what your art is. I'll tell you what I see. I'm just curious. Yeah. Deborah, that's the beauty of abstraction. If I put up a painting on the wall, and I actually did have a group of writers come and write. It was a while ago. They, I, and these were professional writers. I had them come in and write about three or four different paintings. They were so different. And if I were to line up 10 different people in the studio, they'd all see different things. So we, we live our lives through our own lens. So what's important to me is that people feel something that they feel. That's the thing. And if people feel strongly about something, even if it's just a color, like sometimes you can stand in front of an orange and it's just, it makes you feel something. So my, my, my sense is if I allow someone to really feel things, then my job is successful. And this is something that all my collectors say that these are very emo emotive, energetic paintings. And you either get it or you don't. Like, and people buy these my paintings because they fall in love. There's something that is compelling enough that they want to spend the money to live with them. So I do love that, the fact that I'm never going to know which painting really is going to inspire which collector because I'm not that person. They've got their whole history in life that they're bringing. One person may love blue. One person may not love blue. I've so also seen that as I've lived my life, my favorite colors have changed, which I don't know why, but when I was younger, I was so drawn to the color red, which I still love the color red, but I find that as I've gotten older, I'm more drawn to obviously purples and blues and greens. And I'm like you, I love color. I love it. Colors make me happy. So I, I, I really love it. But Amadea, do you ever get commissioned to do a piece? Because with your work, I would hope that if somebody commissions you, they would just say, maybe I love these colors and then step back and let you do your art. Yeah. I don't know. It seems like you're not the type of artist that I'm going to say, okay, I want exactly that. No. Cause you're never going to get exactly that. Cause no. this is no. a year's worth of, yeah. No, there, I can't even recreate one of my paintings. If I try it's because it's a slice of history and time. And if I try and recreate it, it means that I'm not in the moment. I'm trying to create something from the past and it, it never works. That life and energy and vitality I'm talking about is not there. So yes, I do commissions and it's oftentimes someone will see one of my paintings that they like from the past and they'll just say, wow, I really like that. Can you do something similar? Right. And right. Then I'm, I know, and I always say it's not going to be the same. It cannot be the same. I actually did a commission to right before the, I think it was the year before the lockdown. And I, it was for a collector that I had met on a retreat and they were building a extraordinary house in Cabo, Mexico. And so I actually, because they wanted me to paint this huge painting, it was the centerpiece of their living room. I actually went down there and spent four days because I needed to feel the space. I needed to see what they were looking at through the windows. I needed to be there so that I could create something that 
that was going to be a part of that environment. And I've done that. And I have had quite a few opportunities to do commissions where, and I need, I normally need to go see the space and I talk at length to the collectors and I get a sense of who they are and which of my work they like. And it's a very, it's a cool process. It's a cool process. It's a little stressful because right. you never are a hundred percent sure that they're going to like it. But for me, it's worked out. I don't do it a lot, but right. I, because I have so much work that normally collectors are confused because there's a lot to choose from. So oftentimes it's more, oh my God, which one, as opposed to we want another one. Right, different. right. So you're feeling the energy of the individual and the space, and then you're putting it on canvas, really. Well, yes, but it's also through my lens. Good point. Yep. It's not, it is about them, but it's really about me. I use them be, just as a, I have some kind of connection and I need to know, because I have a lot, this is another thing I wanted to say. I have a lot of bodies of work that are quite different. I've been painting for decades so I have a series of white paintings. I have, I, I do actually have a series of very of figurative expressionist paintings where it's an expressionist painting, but there's kind of primordial figures. I've got purely abstract work. So I need to get a sense from the collector which of those they want and which is going to be appropriate. I need to see the scale of the space to determine I paint big. So it, it's more about getting a sense of which direction they want me to go in. And then it's up to me. And if, if it's too specific, I won't do it because it's not, and th that kind of person's not going to hire me anyway, because they get what I'm about. They want to be surprised. Right. Oh, yeah, I like that. So I know you also, along your entire journey, have been giving back. And that's one thing I love about your work. And I think your work really reflects that. And you had mentioned Create and Prosper New as one of the many things you're doing. And you're actually coaching, making sure that other artists can join. Because I, I will just say, my, I have a, I didn't tell you this, but I have a 34-year-old daughter with Down syndrome. And oh. she's always resented that the world expects her to be a happy girl every second of the day. She's a complex woman. She's a complex woman, but she's also an artist and she paints at, with abstracts. And ever since she was a little kid, I loved how she used colors. And I always said to her, this is beautiful because art is in the eyes of the beholder. And even I know blind artists that have been blind since birth that are painters wow. and people that have, I know it's incredible and people that have lost their sight, but continue to paint. So deciding that people can't be an artist, certainly a working artist is ridiculous. And so I know that's something that you want to make sure that people can use their gifts and that we all have gifts. So can you talk a little bit about how you're yeah. supporting that? Well, I was it maybe five years ago. I, I just got this very strong feeling that I wanted to coach other artists because I have a lot of experience. And I've learned a lot of things along the way. I've made mistakes. I've been at it a long time. And so I got a very strong hit that I wanted to start helping other artists hopefully get where I've gotten, but faster. And there's not a lot of people out there who are, who understand the business side of art. And I don't, in my coaching, I'm not really teaching painting. I'm more helping people to create a career, create their website, their artist statement. How do they put together, how do they create a, a solid body of work? How do they approach a gallery? How do they create a portfolio? I work also on the mindset about, which is what I discussed, these elements that I had to go through in order to become a full-time artist. There was a lot of mental shifting that had to happen. And I work on that level with people. So I actually did a one-year coaching certification course 
I lose track of time, five or six years <laughs> ago. And so I have worked with a slew of mostly women, but not exclusively artists. I work with them for a minimum of 90 days, a three month program, which is custom one-on-one. -on -one. And I work on them really differently depending upon where in their career they are. Everybody's got different needs and they're at different stages. And I work globally because of course now with Zoom, I can work all over the world. So that has been very gratifying because I feel like I have really been able to help these artists excel way faster than they would have. And part of it is confidence building. I think that one of the things that a lot of artists, early, early artists lack is confidence. And so when they have someone like me that they respect and admire that has what they want, who gets behind them, it's a very powerful just to be witnessed and to have support and to have someone saying, yeah, you're good. You, you're you good. And that's a big piece of it. I have to say, agree. people never got that from their parents or from their school. Oh, no. no, I agree. And, and you always have to be perfect. It all has to be perfect. And I don't know what that means, right? Yeah, I generally work with artists that are very committed. Like they're already have, they're at a place where they really are committed to making this a, a life, either a career or a serious enterprise. And so I don't really work with beginning artists so much, but with artists that are already two or three years in, sometimes a little more that are ready to take their work and their career to the next level where whatever that is for them. So Amadea, what, what would you recommend for somebody that really wants to follow in your footprint, your follow your journey, which of course we all have our own journeys, but what if they're being told they can't do it and they're not an artist and you can't make a, you can't make a living as an artist even though I believe the world has shifted and we need more artists and musicians and creatives, I, I think this is how, I, I think it's just a natural part of us human beings. But also, Amadeo, why do you think it's so important for successful women like you, for example, to give back and help other artists and other creatives? Look at, we're not, we're all living we're all interconnected on this planet. If we haven't learned that by now, it's we're not isolated little islands. Every human interaction, it's we're completely enmeshed and connected and woven together. And we just could not do it all on our own. I got support. I needed I sought out I've worked with a number of different coaches, therapists. I sought out different people that had what I wanted at certain pivotal moments of my life. You don't get a coach that doesn't have what you want. That person has to have demonstrated that they've further along the path than you are and you get help. And you also have to, I, I believe for me, I needed to have a spiritual life because I needed also to feel like I'm part of something much bigger than I am and that it's not just all about my little me. When I, I ask to be a vessel, a bigger creative energy can move through me. And creatives need to remember that. And sometimes we get so caught up in our little worlds that we forget that, yeah, we are all connected. And we don't, I don't know which one of my paintings is going to touch which person, but I have to keep connected to my own process. I have to move forward. Each artist has to have enough faith and enough desire to engage in their own process and to stay out of their way as best they can. And so it's a dance between developing a muscle of faith and being committed to showing up in your studio or in front of your computer or whatever. If you're an actress, you show up for your craft and show up not once a week, 
not a couple times a month, but every day or as close to it as you can, you create the discipline to show up for yourself, even when it's hard. And trust me, there are days when I come in here, everything is a complete, total mess. And it's the last place I want to be. But I don't run away. I have to stay in the discomfort. I have to breathe through it. I, and if I stay in the discomfort long enough, inevitably, there's going to be a choice that I make that's going to move me past that. At least it's going to take me to the next level. But you don't get to the next level until you're in this level. So you have to be willing to be where you are. And at certain pivotal moments, you have to seek out support. And you have to know that it's there because it is. It could right. be someone you meet in the coffee shop. Yesterday, I went down to get some, to do some grocery shopping to get some food at a takeout at this health food store. And I sat down to eat my dinner. Two little musicians were sitting next to me. We started chatting. They, one guy pulled out his guitar and started jamming. Before I knew it, what I mean, they, these guys get together every week in a group and jam and they want to come and see my studio. And I'm thinking I could offer my studio as a place for these guys to come and play and jam and com commune, be in, be in community. So we have to, it's like there's opportunities everywhere. I, I believe that. And we have to be open and trusting that we'll be guided to the place that we need to be guided to and the people who are going to help us. And that's what I would say. And you've got to listen to that guidance because the guidance talks quietly. That's why meditation helps, but you got to listen. But I know that I've taken a bunch of your time. I love your work. I love, love, and I love how you give back. But let's make sure the audience knows how to get in touch with you. So can you tell us your website? Are you on social media? How, yes, could, how can people find and, out about and you? Thank you, Deborah, for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It's an honor. It's an honor. I love your work. So my website is my name. It's thank you. So in order to see my work, you can go to my website, which is www.amadeabailey.com. That is spelled A-M-A-D-E-A-B-A-I-L-E-Y.com. And I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. It's again, facebook.com slash Amadea Bailey, instagram.com slash Amadea Bailey, and if you're interested in looking at my coaching website, it's createandprospernow.com. createandprospernow.com. And there you can get all kinds of information and you can always reach out to me through my website. We appreciate you. We appreciate you so much. And I love your work. And thank you for the light you're putting in the world because we need it right now. So thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. As a reminder, if you haven't signed up for our movement, billion-strong.org, please do. It's a free movement. We're stronger together. So thank you, Amadea. And I will talk to everyone later. You've been listening to Human Potential at Work. To learn more about Rue Global Impact, visit rueglobal.com. And to learn more about Billion Strong, an identity and empowerment organization designed to bring the billions of voices of persons with disabilities together, you can join the global community and donate at billion-strong.org. That's billion-strong.org.